Hey everyone, this is Corey from Bitbeam Cannon, and with me as always is Mike. Say hi, Mike. Hey, how's it going? And today we're playing Streets of Rage 2, a very well-known classic Mega Drive brawler. We very much enjoy gathering inspiration from classic retro titles. If you've seen our previous gameplay videos for Black Belt on the Master System and Altered Beast for the Mega Drive, these titles inspired the creation of Damon Claw, our ongoing project which I'm art directing and programmed by Mike in Construct 2. In the same way, there are specific games which inspired Mike to design our other game project, Metro Siege. One of those games is Knights of the Round, an arcade game also ported to the Super NES. But it wasn't inspiring for its theme or setting, but rather its interesting gameplay mechanics. The other major inspiration, of course, is Streets of Rage 2, which is arguably one of the best retro street brawlers to ever exist. So, today we're going to give it a go. We did purchase and attempt to play this game on Steam, the same as Altered Beast, but sadly, again, trying to play multiplayer was causing too much lag in this version. We don't know if this is true for other platforms, but it's just a word of warning for anyone who wants to play these Sega Classic games with online multiplayer through the Steam PC version. So, we decided to fire up the old emulator like last time, which works a lot better. Jump into this, we should be synced up, I believe, and we want to set the options Lines here. Yep. Yeah. Players to fire, that is. Yes. <laughs> not not <laughs> confusing language. <laughs> yeah. you know. Five on-screen players simultaneously. <laughs> right. Of course, at that point, due to sprite limitations, there would only be one enemy for all five players to beat up. <laughs> Alright, so I guess I'll be Axel for now. Alright, I'll be Blaze. Alrighty. Alright, and just in case anyone does not know yet, there is a life hidden at the bottom left behind that oh, phone, yeah. uh, that newspaper box or whatever that is, mailbox type thing. Saying I need it more than you. So. Yeah, I played this game <laughs> incessantly for decades with my brother, so probably. I'm sure you have much more experience. I, I did play this a decent amount back in the day, but it, you know, not quite as much over the years, so. Yeah, and the other thing is, we're playing two-player, and I right. think I had way more experience, like, every time I played this game, or virtually, was with my brother, two-player, and the uh, enemies behave a bit differently. Oh. Just so you know, yeah, if anyone caught that, uh, you can land on your feet when thrown in Streets of Rage uh, 2 and 3, which makes the game even more fun, and makes you, uh, it, it makes the game even easier for you. And the way to do that is once you've been thrown, just keep holding up on the D-pad, and then the split second you're about to hit the floor, just press the jump button while up is still held on your D-pad, and you'll land on your feet taking no damage. Nice. As opposed to quite a bit of damage if you land with a thud. It happens so quick, so. You, it almost yeah. looks like a glitch or something. When it happens, yeah. you know, it's yeah. like you just kind of are standing there all of a sudden. Exactly. But it, yeah, it, it does work. It isn't a intended move I say. that's a good point I think there are a couple of crouch type frames in the uh, character's animation set for when he yeah for when you get back up after picking up an item so they could have switched to that animation right which would have made it look more convincing that you've landed on your feet like a cat or a ninja or a ninja cat yeah but um, yeah that's uh, you know, obviously the fact that it functions is more important than how nice it looks. It's a great addition to the gameplay. Yeah. But it is a good point that they did actually have the art already in the game, so they could have theoretically worked that in there. Yeah, it, not really a criticism uh, yeah, necessarily. Yeah. Uh, just it's just a fast, you know. But it is it is very uh, handy. So. Yeah, but I noticed uh, I, I noticed uh, when practicing with Blaze, as opposed to the other characters, she's got such a range that you don't yeah. get nearly as often close to people. So Very she true. doesn't get thrown quite as much. But then later in the game, it gets ah. kind of insane. Yeah, you would never know <laughs> that <laughs> I played this game so much at the moment. One one thing I noticed that's funny 
is I've been testing and playing Metro Siege so much, right. which is very inspired by this game, but has some very different control elements that uh, I, I find myself in different situations doing what I would do with the Alex character in Metro Siege instead of Axel here. And of course, right. oh, so sorry. Oh, no problem. Okay. And uh, yeah, th that move just doesn't exist in here. Like in uh, Metro Siege, you can actually block and counterattack. Uh, and th there's a different way to get out things like the back attack and stuff, so that's actually causing my brain trouble <laughs> <laughs> as I readapt to uh, the control scheme of... Uh, I mean, there's definitely a lot of overlap, but the few differences and the extra moves and mechanics from Metro Siege I find myself trying to do. Yeah, my experience, my earlier experiences with these games came from Final Fight, uh, the very yeah. first... Super Nintendo game. Yeah. Uh, it was one. Of, I think it was one of the first games I had for that system. Right. And you know, they they did borrow a lot from that. Uh, oh yeah, definitely. In terms of the the way you move around and things you can do, right. you probably need that. Uh, yeah, thank you. There. Thanks for pointing um, that out. I was looking at my health bar. So yeah, some of that is is still instinctive in me, but yep. there's there's those few things to get used to with this one. So yeah. So it, it was interesting for me, like I knew we were going to do this video and I did want to give some art uh, analysis and feedback and it was really weird for me to, uh, having played this game my whole life and loved it so much and never given it a really critical eye as a pixel artist, it was really interesting. It was like the seeing the game for the first time in a sense, like from a very different point of view. Right. And. Um, it's interesting, it's one of those games, like, even back when I was a kid, if a game had bad art or really amazing art, I would definitely take notice. But with Streets of Rage, and specifically this uh, Streets of Rage 2 here, I always thought it looked good, but it never, like, wowed me as absolutely groundbreaking. And so, right. like, everything, the artists did their job very well, nothing, go ahead and get that apple if you want. Uh, nothing was super impressive, but also nothing was bad or out of place, which is definitely a good thing. It's definitely got a very nice, very cohesive, very reliable visual style. Right. And I love the fact that, you know, we've discussed this in most of the past forensic pixology videos, is the Genesis slash Mega Drive was very prone to what I call confetti syndrome because of the fairly reduced... Um, fairly limited color range and um, amount of possible colors on screen. They would rely a lot on dithering and things would be over con contrasty. But in this game, there's uh, the characters always show up beautifully against the background. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And uh, that's even though, to a large degree, the um, look at this cheap thing you could do to most enemies and even mm -hmm. many bosses. Mm -hmm. If you time it right with Alex and Blaze, not you can't do this with Max so easily. I tried it today, but literally I could just gum her up and kill her without her ever having a chance to do anything. But I won't do that. That's no it, fun to it, watch. It seems to happen a little more with Blaze. I notice that it's easier to pull off the quicker combos yeah. with with Axel. Um, yeah. But... Oh. So yeah, they like, uh, and one thing to keep in mind for everyone that's like studying pixel art and stuff like that, it's a little misleading if like we play these old games on modern emulators in monitors mm -hmm. that are incredibly crisp and not blurry, unlike the CRT monitors of the time. So uh, keep in mind the the artists that were making this, even their workstations were CRT monitors, which were very blurry. So um, even though like they look very high contrast and sometimes the dithering is very visible, mm -hmm. keep in mind that wasn't the aesthetic they were making. That's not what they were seeing when they were doing the art. So some of this very extreme saturated colors and contrast yep. was not a direct choice they were making. It's what looked best on the monitors of the day. Yep. So it's it's worthwhile to keep that in mind at least when you're finding influence from these games. It's worth it to either see them on a CRT monitor or use a good emulator that emulates a CRT monitor well right. uh, to get a better idea of what they were really going for with their contrast and color choices. Mm -hmm. 
And th this, I, I love th this level. They do a really great job of keeping the environment. It still feels gritty, right. but there's a way less dithery detail. And you've got this beautiful, darkly lit uh, city skyline in the background that isn't too distracting, yet still being quite detailed. Right. And then the foreground uh, sort of bridge pavement is very simple, but it has enough pock marks uh, and enough going on on it and dark enough colors that uh, it just looks great. Yeah, and from a gameplay perspective, it's you get through those first two scenes and you're thinking, oh man, it's it's like you know we're we're getting sort of the same thugs over and over, and then like yeah. right when you start to think that, then these guys, <laughs> you know, these guys come yeah. out, and uh, it's a nice mix up of the gameplay, you know. Yeah. So. Uh, let's see. I will probably switch over at some point before the end of the video and use at least Max, the right. other very popular character uh, in the game. It would be kind of a shame to not see one of the other major characters. Um, Are you thinking of, of having yeah. that sort of feature in Metro Siege where you can like switch... Uh... Yeah, switch and people I, like mid-play or something. Uh, yeah, I really don't like it. The fact that you like have to die on per purpose and uh, lose a bunch of lives, or wait until you've died a bunch of times to switch characters. Right. Um, so yeah, it'll be worth it to mention some of the additional gameplay differences the um, between this and Metro Siege. Right. Uh, Metro Siege, like I said, it has blocking and counter attacking, which are very strongly influenced. I think the next game we should play. Uh, for that reason, uh, for several reasons, is Knights of the Round. Because oh, yeah. For one thing, it's it's it has a... A lot of people play through that entire game never knowing you can block and counterattack. <laughs> and it's it makes that game so much more fun and nuanced. And uh, yeah, these guys are a pain. Uh, I am playing much more <laughs> poorly than normal because I'm yeah. trying to actually structure sentences and make sense at the same time. <laughs> uh, but, um, yeah, so Knights of the Round, it has a really cool oh, counterattack. Yep, thank you. Uh, Playmate, I got it just the last second. I, I really dislike the fact that in uh, Streets of Rage 2 here, there's, like, nothing you can do if they grab you from behind. Mm -hmm. Aside from uh, spam on the, um, the desperation move button. Right. And hope that when... Oh, darn it, I got that for no reason. Oh, uh, right. Hope that when they let go... Uh, that you will get out your desperation before they get out that cheap, super powerful jab that knocks you down instantly. Yeah. But, um, so I was just saying, yeah, Knights of the Round it has a really cool mechanic. I think what you do is hold attack and press back, and you'll block, and you could keep block held for a while, but then if you had initiated block that split second before the enemy attack hits you, it'll you'll slide back and blink white, and while you're blinking white, if you press attack, you'll do a powerful counter-attack move. There's a hidden life right there, bottom left again, behind the truck. Move around a little bit up and down and keep pressing until you hear the life noise. I think you got it. Okay. I could be wrong, but we'll see how it goes. I think. I don't know. Yeah, if you can't hear the <laughs> audio of the game really loudly, it's hard to tell sometimes because there's so much other noises going on. It'll be fine. Yep. I got this nice. uh, roadblock apple. Yeah. So. <laughs> Oops. All right. There's another move that some people don't know about. If you hold attack and press uh, jump while attack button is held, you'll mm -hmm. do a back attack. If you're not holding a weapon, but if you're holding a weapon and you do that same button uh, combination, you'll throw the weapon oh, at okay. like. You'll turn it into a projectile weapon, basically, and it's a one-shot attack, and it's a way to get rid of the weapon if you don't want it anymore. So, yeah, going back to the differences, is the additional moves in Metro Siege, uh, we added a whole aspect to the gameplay where you can hit your hit enemies while they're down. So after you knock an enemy down, uh, there's several ways to hit them while they're down. You can throw other enemies into them. And, or you can, um, <clears throat> excuse me, yes. or there's a specific uh, attack for enemies that are down. If you go over them while they're lying down, then you can um, hold attack and tap down, and you'll basically oh. kick them while they're down. They call that the no mercy move. Yeah, this guy's a pain in the butt if you don't know the super specific way to fight him. 
But like you wait at a distance. Oopsie. You wait at a distance for him to come flying at you, and you jump straight up and do your kick attack, mm -hmm. and he'll just get slammed every time. Just grab that turkey. Yeah, I noticed uh, practicing in single Oops. player that it, when when there's two players, it, it's like the AI of the enemies is a little less predictable. You know, yeah, uh, so it, it mixes it up a lot. Yeah. yeah. There we go. Taken care of. So yeah, so you can you can do like kick them while they're down repeatedly while standing there uh, with holding attack and tapping down. Uh, or you can do a much more risky move and jump up in the air and then tap down quickly while you're over them and you'll do like either an elbow drop or a, a knee slam so to speak. I don't think there's a life here but there could be, I don't remember. It's been too long since I've played this game. I used to play it constantly. But yeah, the scrolling is the wrong way, that always drives me nuts of the yeah. foreground layer. Yeah. Oh, it's the game's lagging a bit now. Did you I mean, there's that? a it's way you can do that to make it seem... Uh... Like it's a, as opposed to a pan, but more of a rotation. Exactly. Uh, but exactly. It, 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 does, it still doesn't look right, you know? Cause it, yeah, well, like you know? why would why would now the camera be in a, in place and rotating to follow us instead right. of, uh, <laughs> like it just does, it's disorienting and, and it's not, a, oops, oh. <laughs> second. Yeah, we, if you accidentally grab me, just jump twice, press the jump button twice and you'll switch sides and then again and then let me go automatically. Right. Or you could throw me and I'll likely land on my feet, so... But it's easy to accidentally uh, suplex me instead of throw me. Right. So. Oh, that's another nice difference in uh, in Metro Siege. The, uh, you don't just grab people by walking into them, because it's way too easy to accidentally gra grab your friend or grab an enemy when you don't want to. Oh, yeah. Uh, so in uh, Metro Siege, you hold the attack button and tap forward, or there's going to be two different uh, control methods, uh, control setups. There's two button or three button mode. In three button mode, there's like a button specific to things like grabs and counters. But in, in two button mode, which is what we're working on right now, if you hold attack and tap forward once, your character will lunge forward quickly doing a grabbing motion with his hands. Mm -hmm. And so that's a way you're very, very specifically, you only grab someone when you wanted to grab them. And the nice thing is it also quickly closes the distance on the enemy and grabs them when their guard is down. Right, so right. it's just a much nicer, more natural uh, grabbing method that makes it so you just never accidentally grab friend or foe when you don't want to. And in the similar fashion by default, like way too often in this game and final fight, uh, you've got all this stuff going on and you end up with like five different weapons and pickups on the screen and you don't want to pick them up but just tapping the attack button will grab the item on the ground so mm -hmm. even if a powerful enemy is in front of you and about to smash you you want to hit them first but instead you just uh, grab that item you didn't want to grab and then you get knocked on your butt Mm -hmm. So, uh, in, in Metro Siege, by default, again, you hold attack and tap down when you're over uh, an item, and that's how you pick it up, and that makes sure you don't... Like, it's it's also very easy to accidentally grab a health pickup that your partner needs, because you wanted to punch an enemy that happened to be, you know, you were too close to the pickup while you were trying to punch an enemy, and you... Oops, I just grabbed that life-saving street turkey trash turkey you know when <laughs> yeah. my partner needed it because i wanted to punch an enemy right um, so yeah adding that extra bit of nuance to the command makes it so all of those accidental actions uh don't happen um right. which is especially important in two-player mode those are some uh nicely scaled barrels i believe yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah unlike a certain game we recently did a uh, forensic pixology on which is still a very cool game, but definitely there were a few uh, artistic shortcomings uh, mm -hmm. that we discussed in the video. Still looks like a great game, but we, we should do a, a let's play of that sometime too. Uh, you can go ahead and grab that life as well. Uh, ninja guys. Yeah. Oh yeah, another thing uh, I should just really quickly mention some technical specs about the Mega Drive so that people that are watching this know what kind of graphical limitations the artists were working with. 
Uh, one, in general, memory is always a concern. Memory for cartridges was always very expensive, so they, they didn't have the luxury of all this memory to be able to work with uh, like we do these days, even when we make like sort of fake retro games. Right. But, um, you know, just using pixel art style, but we have all of the um, memory. We can add as many frames of animations as we want when we're making, like, not legit uh, retro games um, or, like, yeah. hardcore they, they had to make a lot of decisions about how much art do you want to dedicate to characters versus environments and exactly. and also how many characters do we can we fit in the whole game because like right. that, that was its own concern even more so than just memory in any given instance it's like how much right. can we fit on here you know? on the entire card yeah right and uh, yeah, like one thing they could do that was great is you can swap things out of memory in the cartridge very quickly, nearly instantly. So when you need to introduce a boss, like you just dump out one of the basic enemies and then you've got that extra RAM and you could just load in super fast the, uh, the artwork for the boss. But you've still got an extremely limited amount of storage space in the cartridge to begin with. That was nicely done. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, you and I were distant enough on the y-axis from each other that we didn't accidentally hit each other, but we could both hit the boss at the same time. Or he wasn't a boss, some boss, so to speak. Yeah. But yeah. careful, these explode when you knock oh, them yeah. open. Mm. I say that as I make it explode on both. No, ones. I, I, I remember uh, from when I was practicing, and then I just completely uh, easy thing yep. to forget, I guess. There's one hidden life in this level exactly centered under the head of the H.R. Giger-esque type uh, boss. Um, so we'll remember that when the uh, when we're at that boss fight. So yeah, like one thing I loved about this game as compared to Final Fight is there's quite a few additional moves to the uh, gameplay, to the gameplay mm -hmm. mechanic compared to Final Fight. In, it's just enough to really allow you to play with a lot of style. Right. Like you could really switch it up. You could play one game and say, I want to play more defensively, or I want to use the uppercut more, or I want to use jump attacks more, or I want to just like really mix it up a lot. And, um, you know, like you could, for the finishing punch, I could turn around and do the back attack, or I can jump straight up and do that uh, double hit kick, or I could headbutt them to death. I used to do that and call it the kiss of death. Like, right. make sure that the headbutt was always the last attack that, that I would use to kill the enemies and stuff like that. So, that's definitely one way that I think this had a, a real leg up on uh, Final Fight. Which, of course, it was made after Final Fight yeah. as well, so, you know. Yeah, they had that to, advantage uh, yeah, to, exactly. to innovate a little bit. But, yeah, yeah and I remember being disappointed uh, that that first Final Fight was just single player. I was like, oh. Yeah, you know, uh, yeah. and was missing a character, you know, from yeah. the arcade. I was like, ah, you know, growing pains and that dreaded uh, memory cost, you know. Mm -hmm. But that, to me, that was like a really bad decision from a marketing standpoint. Mm -hmm. Like, and they really got showed up on the. Uh, oh, I need that. Uh, if you walk straight down to the bottom and press attack, you'll grab the life. Like right under that boss head, straight down. No, no, straight down. There you go, right there. Okay. There you go. You got it. All right, so uh, get over here because this paint, this boss is a pain in the butt if we're both on either side. You know, they play volleyball with each other. All right, and then come back here as soon as it starts moving. Oops, sorry. <laughs> All right, get ready. There it is. All right, and you just jump straight up and attack, but make sure we're in different rows as it gets near. Oh. You be the backup in case it knocks me down. You uh, you attack it. So get a little bit farther away from me. Yeah. Ah. Otherwise, like this, there you go. Get yeah, it. it seemed easy enough uh, on yeah. single player, but I, I don't. I'm ah. not sure. It, this this is such a strange thing for this game. Uh... Yeah, it is really out of left <laughs> field, and it's really the only level like that that's so crazy. Um, I mean, it's it's like I, I get it. They were in a, a theme park, but then it's like there's yeah. a legit. Alien, alien boss. And, yeah, <laughs> so, exactly. I don't know. Um, yeah. I don't know what to think about it. But. So there's actual aliens, and the way they lie low <laughs> is being in a fun house in a, you know, some amusement park somewhere. All right, watch out for the explosions. Oh boy, nice job. 
Ooh. This guy's a pain in the butt in two player mode. Oh, yeah, he is. Let's get, oh, oh, sorry, get sorry. Uh, oh, I meant problem. to get the. Like in general, oh, oh, I died. Go ahead and get yeah. Uh, oh, you don't need it now. All right. Yeah, we'll save that. Oh, oh I, I should ah. mention there's an incredibly cool and useful uh, sort of bug uh, that exploit you can do in this game, but it's really hard to set up. But uh, ah, the place yeah. that's easiest to get it out. <clears throat> Excuse me. Is the uh, elevator near the end? You know, every uh, fighting game needs the elevator scene near the end oh, boss. Yeah. But um, if you get a <sighs> bunch of enemies kind of in a group together, and the two players get on either side of the group and press attack at the exact same moment, the our collision attack boxes overlap a bunch of enemies and each other at the same time. The entire game gets into a loop. And instead of all the enemies getting hit once by that attack, they get hit every loop over and over and over again. The sound screws up and goes And then every, the whole game freezes until every enemy dies and they all fall to their death at the same time and then the game unfreezes. Wow. Now my brother and I used to call that Wonder Twin Powers. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, it's it, it's awesome when you can pull it off. I have no idea if it's easier or harder or impossible to pull off while you're doing the online play because the um, the, the frame rate uh, takes a real hit when you're online playing. So I don't know if it's possible or not. Uh, but in actual two-player, you know, in the same room, in the same house, uh, once you get good at it, it's actually easy to pull off and a lot of fun. Get tired of those knife runners. A classic, you know, kung fu move. Yeah. <laughs> running, running with a knife. But, uh, ah, yeah, those knife guys. There we go. Oh. Oops. Oh. <laughs> yeah, my brother and I developed a uh, general. Just, uh, looks a general so goofy, rule. the overflow. Yeah. Uh, since you can't turn off, I don't think. Maybe there's a cheat to do so, but uh, yeah, maybe there is. Like, uh, turn off the ability to grab or hit your uh, your friend. Mm -hmm. Like in Metro Siege, by default, you can't grab your friend, and you can hurt your friend accidentally by throwing a guy. Because, you know, I mean, if you throw a human being in the direction of your friend and they're there, it's going to hit them. But it's kind of silly that you're throwing a jab at a bad guy. Like in, like in this game and in almost every fighting game, uh, there can be an entire group of people in front of you sp spread out a bit and your jab is magically hitting everybody <laughs> all right. at the same time. It's like your fist, you can't see because it's 2D <laughs> graphics, but your fist is, you know, like five feet wide going into the depth yeah. of that. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, so we actually, uh, uh, the programmer Alex worked really hard to, um, to work it out so that that's not the case. You can only, like, attacks that should only be able to hit one enemy at a time, it only hits one enemy, but when you do hit them, when they jerk back or especially stumble back, then uh, then oh. they'll bump into each other. And they're also programmed in their AI to, to not bundle together so much. Right. So it's a much more uh, realistic, um, in that regard, you can't just keep jabbing a giant group. Yeah. Like, remember that trick the I five, mentioned? The five face punch, I guess. <laughs> you know, yeah, exactly. I guess what yeah. you call it. Yeah, like, remember I was showing with that whip lady in the bar uh, early on that I mentioned you can just space out your jab and kill that enemy and they can't do anything? You can actually do that to an entire group of people if your jab is hitting them and, like, they don't have a chance. And, uh, yeah. So we're doing our best to eliminate things like accidental uh, grabbing people, accidentally grabbing items, and um, uh, accidentally hurting your, your friend and stuff like that. But yeah, I was going to say, my brother and I, we had this uh, sort of agreement worked out for gameplay when we played this game, mm -hmm. that one player would tend to stay on the top half of the screen and the other on the bottom. Yeah, I've been like, trying to stick to that a, yeah. a little bit, you know? But. Right. But it was unspoken, and oh, I didn't really get that. we've no. never played this game together, so we're not really uh, synchronized. Right. You know, like we. Oh, I need. Uh, there's an apple. I'm gonna grab. There yeah, we go. Yeah, you need both of them. Actually. All right. Cool. Thanks. Oh, now I really need one too. Yeah, I should occasionally. Yeah, again, like really nice use of muted colors and not having contrast mm -hmm. too in in large part really helps this game uh, not have that sort of confetti syndrome. 
these are the perfect enemies to once you stun them, just keep uh, keep jabbing them until they die, because otherwise they're such a nuisance. But it's hard with Blaze. It's really easy with. Uh, with <laughs> there we <Act>. go. <laughs> yep. Oh, that's fun. Yeah. <laughs> There's a trick at the end of this elevator scene, just after you've killed the very last enemy. Mm -hmm. You wait like a second and a half, and then you can jump, and you'll they turn off the uh, limiter for where the players can be, like that collision. Yeah. Uh, so you can jump outside of the screen. You can jump into the wall there, the blue wall. But it requires really careful timing. Nice. Yeah, this is another um, part where it, it gets slightly strange. Again. It's like, where are these guys coming oh, yeah, yeah, from, yeah. you know? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a secret, get a load of this, it's a totally secret, like, military silo base hidden under a <laughs> baseball field. And then, who is under there? Is it, like, a government, uh, you know, like, <laughs> right. some kind of government lab or nuclear? Uh, no, it's... The ultimate warrior, <laughs> you know what I mean? Oh, I mean someone that looks it's, a it's lot his like brother, you know, yeah, exactly. it's his cousin or something. It's the penultimate yeah. fighter. <laughs> Oops! Oh, that was weird. I've never seen that before. All right, so no, it's not the last oh. enemy. Yet. I'm trying to, I'm trying to do that trick at the end when the last enemy dies, but I don't remember when the last enemy is. So. As soon as every batch is dead, I do the jump thing. Let's see. Yeah. It might be him. Man, no, this no. thing is like going down so fast, too. Like yeah. that, that is so For miles. It's where miles <laughs> underground. And for what? For yeah. the ulti penultimate fighter to just have a uh, sudden like death match against <laughs> people he had no idea were on the way. But he's just waiting down there. Really? I hope someone finds the super secret silo base. <laughs> Yes, I did it. There we go. Oh, whoa. See how I'm off screen there? Yeah. We're not off screen, but outside of the collision area. Okay, um, All right. This guy on. is a giant. So, yeah, this guy is really unfair until you learn the pattern for him. So, luckily with a uh, with Axel, uh, almost everyone, like the um, his double tap forward uppercut yeah. is like a universal solution for everything in the game. Damn it, sorry about that. <laughs> but, yeah, the, uh, the the penultimate fighter, he does that thing where he becomes completely invulnerable mm. once you're beating him up and does that move. Yeah, yeah. Oops. I found in single player it was best to keep your distance from him, yeah, but yeah. at the same time, uh, you know, with both of us, it's like yeah, two people fighting one guy, it gets, <laughs> it gets a little yeah. crazy. So, and there's a tray, I call that Toro Toro, like just treat him like a raging bull and I just always do the uppercut at him when he charges me and it's uh, it's a very easy way to beat him, and, like you said, in one player or if the other player just hangs back behind the other player, then it works pretty well, but uh, there we go. Nice. He won't last too much longer. Yeah. There we go. So like, there's a trick with the diagonal double tap forward, it catches them off guard. Right. So like you can you can not only be double tapping forward to get out your attack, but you could be moving on a diagonal at the same time, so you can get into range to attack them and catch them off guard, kind of taking advantage of their uh, their their AI, which is based purely on just in front or behind, not so much up or down. Yeah, I don't think there's a life here. I just I forgot. It's pretty embarrassing. Yeah, I, would, I agree with you about the art in this game. Like, you get to various places where you're like, well, that's, you know, that's, it seems kind of generic, but yeah. there's so much variety that it makes up for it. You know, you're never in one place yeah. for that long. So, yeah. yeah. And you're never in a place where you're like, oh, God, this is ugly or this right, is Right, like right. It all feels uh, cohesive. Very cohesive yeah. and, and never offensive uh, to the eye. So yeah, like this is a good way to handle these guys, because otherwise, if they get loose, they can be so obnoxious, especially when there's two or three of them at the same time. I mean, I can steam pipe them. Just saying. Yep. Yeah. You ready? I'm gonna stop. All right. Get ready to hit the pipe or throw it at them, whatever you want. There, there we you go. go. 
and I'll grab that apple. Well, I guess it's a, I guess it's a water pipe. Whatever. Yeah. Oh yeah, I should. I had started mentioning that I was going to talk about the uh, graphical specs of the Mega Drive, and then we mm -hmm. got sidetracked by stuff. Um, but yeah, so the Mega Drive, its color depth is three bits per color channel, which means that there are a total of 512 distinct colors that you can set your palette oh. up with. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yep. And then, uh, so you have 64 color indexes or indices that you can uh, set up with any of those 512 colors. And the cool thing about the Mega Drive is either, like it's broken up into four sets of 16 colors and any, uh, like most consoles and arcade machines back in the day, uh, everything was based on um, uh, tiles and, um, and, you know, like even sprites, they're in memory, they're, they're stored as tiles, oh. usually either 8x8 or 16x16 pixel tiles. Right. But anyway, so the Genesis had two, two scrollable layers that you could scroll independently. And in each of those layers, any tile could use any of the 16 color pal the four different 16 color palettes, and then any sprite. And I think it's 80 sprites the the Mega Drive could display. Mm -hmm. Any sprite could also choose any of those 16 color palettes. Right. Yeah. So it, you don't have a ton of color indices to go around. Uh, I should say still more than uh, the Amiga, which. Uh, Metro Siege is being uh, designed around the graphical limitations of classic Amigas, um, but the Amiga has a uh, much higher color depth of 4096 possible colors instead of 512, mm -hmm. so that really goes a long way. Oh, yeah, and it, it, and it, you know, it, most, from what I can tell, you know, most games follow that that same format like it's a yeah. sort of universal thing as opposed to something like super nes which had all those strange different, different modes, modes. uh yeah. with so affecting many. performance and, and all that um yeah that can get a bit complicated sometimes uh, yeah very whereas uh, mega drive I mean, is is much it, yeah I, w I don't want to say simpler but it's just yeah. you know it's got a the, m many fewer different actual modes. Right. Like yeah. there's uh, resolutions you could switch between, but in general, you're going to be using the same modes. Uh, I should say, I mean, it is definitely true that on the Super, Nint Super Nintendo, the overwhelming majority of games used one particular mode because right. it's so conducive to a typical side-scrolling game uh, where you know you, you've got a few layers of scrolling and you've got plenty of colors per layer and you've got all your sprites and you can set up a cool translucent effect layer, uh, one of the different Mode 7 offerings or right. abilities that the Super Nintendo had under that sort of uh, nope. umbrella of mo what they called Mode 7. Mm -hmm. Real sloppy playing on my part. But, but, uh, yeah, go. yeah, there were, there were a couple of seemingly uh, really almost gimped modes on Super Nintendo, you know, that, that, yeah. that well, they were way, really, way less, yeah, but... Yeah, they were for super specific things. Right. Like, you know, it might be a great mode for a splash screen, but it's got very little support for layered scrolling, or, you know, you're just gonna have more, uh, mode 7 rotation is easier in that mode, or that kind of stuff. But yeah, I found when, uh, when messing around a little bit with Mega Drive stuff, uh, you know, just practicing and everything, that it, it 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 was a a bit of a far cry from from having all this color fidelity of like the four bits per channel, you know, on, on yeah, something like Amiga thing. or yeah. or even higher on the Super NES, and like yeah, that's when you only right. have five twelve total colors ever uh, to use, it gets. Right. You know, it gets tough sometimes getting some subtle colors or gradients going, you know. Yeah, uh, for sure. Which is why you didn't see it that much on Mega Drive. It, yeah, you know. and back in the day it was far less noticeable because CRT monitors were so blurry to begin with. Mm -hmm. But, you know, with modern uh, modern oh. monitors, you really notice the, uh, the difference in how subtle the colors can be that you can create 
and how smooth a gradation can be, especially for things like the sky in the background or anywhere you need a really smooth transition or just really subtle colors. Uh, mm -hmm. 512 total colors to choose from is surprisingly limited, but good artists could do great stuff with it. Like I've, I've been um, repeatedly very impressed with what you've been able to do with these, the, soup, the, the 8 bit Nintendo and the Master System palettes which are drastically more limited than the Mega Drive at uh, something in the area of like, what, 48 colors for the NES? Uh, something like yeah, that, like 64 yeah. for the Master System, maybe, and like 48 for the, something like that. Yeah, the way the Not math, a lot of yeah, the way the math uh, is done, it seems like the lower the bit depth you get, you're gonna have a harder time with darker values, like, like getting yeah. a lot of uh, different darker values. Yeah. And so yeah, Mega Drive, gets a little that way you you, you want to do something that's kind of a you know some subtle shadowy areas and it, it just it's not great at that you know uh, especially yep. getting in the master system it's even worse it's it's pretty bad but uh you know i think that's uh what two two bits per channel that's even that's like 64 colors you know yeah and the uh the 8 bit nintendo was even more oh. weird like it didn't use uh like um just like a simple mathematical division to get like its color palette is not like oh so many bits per color so you get this really mm -hmm. scientifically laid out palette it's much more um or i should say yeah it's not like oh you've got the exact same number of every particular color scheme or something like the master system or any other console but i mean like the old 16 color systems like the commodore 64 and even the pc <clears throat> we're the same. I'm gonna try to get that turkey. Yeah, Oops. Yeah. Nope. I'll try to get him up here. Get it! Okay. <laughs> it's pretty much a uh, bald bull, you know? Yeah. Kind of looks like him. Yeah, definitely. So, oh yeah, I was uh, going to mention, uh, going back to the color and memory limitations. So one great thing that you could do on most of the consoles, <clears throat> going even back to the 8-bit Nintendo, is you had the sprites and then you could use the same graphical data of the sprite and just say okay use this different color palette now so like you could have blue ninjas here running around on the beach or a red ninja so mm. you could change how they look and then also change their behavior a little bit and it adds a huge amount of variety to the appearance and the gameplay with very little additional memory use right um almost no additional memory yeah use. and that that gets more difficult uh, on other systems. I, I guess you could, yeah. if you did your palettes right, you could do it on, you know, uh, anything that could share, you know, like like on Mega Drive, you could do yeah. it, but it's like it takes some planning to get those. Right, uh, yeah, because you values. only have uh, four palettes to go around. Mm -hmm. And of course, you need to make sure if you're going to try to make a sprite use a different. Uh, 16 color set it better have its palette arranged the same way so yeah. that skin tones are skin tones and you know clothing colors are sensible clothing colors uh, and then sometimes you, you know. have to do a scene that's might be complex enough where you just can't you know and then right so you right yeah in any given circumstance like these guys you know like they're doing it uh yep exactly so you've got the green shorts versus the red shorts and you could see the skin colors are different too because they're uh, swapping out the entire six and colors uh, mm. set for the entire sprite. But what you can also do, and I wanted to mention this too, I mentioned that <clears throat> backgrounds and sprites, their graphical data is stored based on the idea of tiles to save memory. And in Metro Siege, because it's being developed from an Amiga standpoint, which it's really fascinating, it does things almost the opposite way than any console. It uses blitting of like just drawing and changing background graphics instead of sprites. Its sprite ability is very weak, but it's blitting of, it's moving around and drawing of background graphics is very strong. Right. So it relies on that even for the moving characters. Uh, and so there's some great things about that. Like you don't need to worry about, like there's never a sprite flicker because you're not using sprites. But at the same time, there's uh, trade-offs such as uh, memory concerns. Uh, there's less, like you don't have that luxury of having different color sets of 16 that you can switch from. Like whatever colors you're using for the background, 
that's what colors you can use uh, that are available for the characters as well. Um, so it's a lot more challenging to make a game that looks really colorful, where the characters really pop off nicely from the background and stuff. Um, yeah, we're trying to. Yeah. yeah, I was gonna say we're trying to stick with that definitely with with Damon Claw. I mean, we we yeah. there's some tricks to get more color in there. Yeah. But yeah, you you know. You have to be much more careful and tricky, right? Uh, and really rely on a lot of skill and a lot of patience and iteration while you're designing the art mm -hmm. to really get that nice sense of depth of the background and nice separation of the characters because you have to use a lot of the same exact colors between the two but create the illusion that that's not the case yeah and also like and we're doing this in Damon Claw, but it's it's kind of difficult to make work like uh, you yep. want to go to a different environment right and so right. you want to change the palette uh, then uh, no, I'm continue here. Right. right. Do you want to use? Oops. Too late. Remind me when I die to right. switch to uh, Max, so people can see Max as well. Right. And then there's um, yeah. What, what was I saying? Um, so yeah, you you're talking about Damon Claw, and oh yeah, if you want to show a new environment that should have oh a new yeah yeah yeah. Scene. So like I. I was thinking, you know, oh, we've got the player. The player's consistent throughout, so he's using right. those environment colors. You have right. to be careful uh, how you make right. that work, you know? Yeah, so the overwhelming majority of colors cannot be changed for the new environment, at least not drastically. Right. Because then the character would suddenly look really weird. He's going to oh, have, did like, he have, yeah, purple yeah. skin or something. Yeah, when and, did he have time to, time to change his armor into pink armor or right. whatever? Um, but we we take it as you know it, it kind of changes the lighting so to speak in the scene so if you keep it fairly consistent then it, subtle, it actually right. looks like a little bit of mood lighting right subtle enough so that the changes to the color palette look like you're just under a different lighting mm -hmm. uh but you you get a nice sense of color variation and we were careful to reserve a couple of color indices that can be totally changed per environment and the careful use of those couple of new colors that you can introduce and something on the Amiga that we call a uh, copper trick or a copper color change. Right. With copper stands for cold processor. And there's this cool trick you can do on some old systems. Uh, you can do it to a, a degree on the Mega Drive and I think the SNES as well, but also on the Amiga. And what you can do is even though it's the same color index <sighs> and it might <laughs> no, I don't really. It might start. There is a cheat to start at a specific level, which we're probably going to have to use near the end of the game because I'm playing so poorly. Um, you oh, know, it's really game. much harder to talk about different topics and play the game. Right. Um, but uh, anyway, yeah, let me get that actually. Yeah, and and you know, it was surprising when, you know, in a way, being forced to do that a bit with the Amiga constraints, but also realizing that developers back in the day could have done that more and they did yeah yeah uh, you know yeah. on 16-bit on systems yeah uh, but I, I understand there's some consistency of keeping the characters the same um, right but yeah I literally especially on like, the Super Nintendo you could have yeah really and, and there were games I believe that might have done that a little bit but it's not common you know yeah I think it was something that the overwhelming majority of developers just never even considered okay I'm gonna pick uh, Max now if I all right all right continue and then Max there we go so this guy he's very slow but you have two different type of dash moves that you can use and the nice thing about him is and I've never played this in before except for a couple minutes of practice earlier today oh nice job no uh, but like you wait till you see how quickly you can drain uh, enemies' uh, health bars with some of Max's moves. It's pretty crazy. He's a walking death machine. Right. Uh, but oh yeah, I was saying. So with the copper color trick, even though it, the game thinks it's just displaying one color, by using this co-processor, every time it's drawing a new what's called scan line or a row across the whole screen of that color, you can completely change what color is being displayed in that color index. Right. So they used to use it extensively in the Amiga, usually just to create these gradients, often kind of gaudy, just like this kind of rainbow gradient for the sky. Man, but yeah. you can actually use it very tastefully and just have a nice transition from light, from dark to light in the sky to create... Look at his health meter go. Um, 
Yeah, and you're going to be more challenged, I would imagine, as we haven't quite done yet, is, is something like a like a top-down game or something yeah. like Amiga. If you wanted to use the copper, it's like it's, you're not going to get as much advantage there as opposed to something where there's a clear exactly. separation of the background uh, very, very upwards true, yeah. in the screen. Right, you can do clever things and like, let's say you were making an overhead vertical scrolling shmup, Mm -hmm. And then you had part of the environment was like paved and the other part was a desert or a forest or dirt. You can design your tiles carefully and um, and actually do a copper color change so that the, the colors that used to make the pavement, they're now, they give you the colors to make the uh, dirt or desert or, you know, forest canopy or whatever. Mm -hmm. So it is still definitely, it can be useful, but you are much more, you have to be way more creative um, right. to really put good use to it. All right, before we kill him, you see that? Oh, oh. He, he just died, but that's, <laughs> that's okay. The guy I'm holding right now, he has blue pants with those big knee pads, and that other guy you just killed, I'm sure another one will come on, or I, I assume. Like this, like this uh, guy here, yeah. Pretty much. Yeah, yeah, it had the same exact uh, pants artwork wise, but they were gray with gray knee pads. Mm -hmm. uh, I hope the game is lagging quite a bit. Hopefully it'll fix itself. But you can get that apple when you feel like it too. Uh, but anyway, my point was because the characters have to be made out of a bunch of sp mm -hmm. sprites kind of stacked around anyway, yeah, it's quite a bit of lag, but I can keep explaining things right. anyway while we go. Yeah. Um, because the, the characters have to be made out of a bunch of sprites anyway, they can carefully develop divide the characters between upper body and lower body and then use a different 16 color uh, set of colors for the upper body and lower body so that's another way to get a lot more visual variety Oops. so far so good can you hear me okay yeah, yeah. all right we had some lag issues before so to mm -hmm. reiterate my point big characters have to be made out of a bunch of sprites so they can decide to use different... Oh, I'm going to get that turkey. Uh, I, I didn't mean hit the enemy, I meant get the actual turkey. I'm going to get that turkey. Right. All right. Um, but yeah, so you can use a different 16-color uh, set for different parts of the character, so that's another way to get more visual variety. Mm -hmm. uh, you can use the same graphics for pair of pants and the lower half of the body and use it for different enemies and give them different pants colors and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, you would so. see that people trying to do things like that on the NES uh, to yep. a limited effect, but it it does yeah. work great if you design your characters right, uh, larger characters. You know, you can save a lot of memory. I think because um, right. I, I think generally uh, characters like this that you know they're not modularly animated or anything. Right. They take up a lot more space than people often realize <laughs> sometimes because <Yeah. laughs> of all their movement and everything. So. Yeah, that's another really important thing to keep in mind when sort of assessing or judging or critiquing the animation in games like this. They had s incredibly limited memory, and because the characters, the only way they could sort of optimize the data without getting a huge amount of sprite flicker to create the animation frames for the enemy, is uh, using it very carefully arranged in tiles so that, hey, you know, in this frame and in this frame, the head's in the same position based on this sprite grid tile, uh, yeah, tile grid, so we can reuse that tile, but you're incredibly limited based on this 8 by 8 pixel or 16 by 16 pixel grid. So it makes it way harder to you reuse body part or head art in new frames, whereas with Metro Siege, uh, because we're using the Blitter on the Amiga, like, the characters are made out of specific body parts which can be put in any place on a pixel-by-pixel -pixel basis. So, you know, I have complete freedom to decide exactly where the head or the arm or the torso is going to be per frame of the character, which is a benefit on the Amiga, but the problem is uh, the Amiga can't do super fast on the fly flipping where most game consoles even the 8-bit ones could flip sprites sorry about that could flip no sprites instantaneously so you don't need the memory uh, you don't need the the um, 
the character facing the other way all those frames to be in memory wasting all that memory you just tell it to display flipped the other way which is a massive savings for a game like that so we really had to wrestle in metro siege and optimize like crazy and put really careful reuse to body part images to be able to fit very robustly animated characters and several of them on screen at the time mm -hmm. Yeah. Is my voice still holding up yeah, okay? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Excellent. Okay. Yeah, it seems to be uh, yeah. getting a little better now. So. And I, I think I mentioned this, started mentioning this a while back, and I don't know if I finished the thought. Uh, but at some point, because it's so interesting, the difference between the way the Amiga handles things compared to the Mega Drive, I think I'll make a separate video all about the specific... Amiga theme technical constraints oh. I had to work with mm -hmm. to make Metro Siege animations and graphics and all that. <clears throat> and in that video, I'll explain in more detail how the Mega Drive would be would handle things in a completely different way. And the, yeah, know, totally, I, the, yep. the comparisons are interesting. You know, uh, yeah. studying them a bit myself. So yeah, I definitely uh, would look, look forward to seeing something like that. Yeah. yeah. Oh, all right. Wow, that was a lot of guys. Yeah, th this is one of the places that is a great time to try the Wonder Twin Powers trick, but <laughs> with the uh, slight lag of the game, it mm -hmm. might not work at all. And since we've never played together at all, it might be really hard to pull up, if not impossible. So it would be getting on either opposite side of a group of people, but far enough away where we're not going to hit each other. And then, oops, not Whoa. good. Yeah, Like what they did to us. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and if we attack at the exact same moment, then we'll get it. But it's almost a moot point now. There's not that many enemies. And your jab can hit like four different uh, <laughs> obese characters at the same exact time. Had to do another elevator. So. Yeah. Oh. These robots explode uh, when they die. Okay. And it's a quite a broad range. Oh, and when they get up, they do this really cheap spinny mace thing. So if you hang around them when they're still down, uh, they'll almost certainly hit you. Oh, okay. So it's better to sort of coax them to jump down onto your level and then immediately hit them with one of your strong combos. Oh. Nice, he's gonna blow up in a minute. Well, yeah. after we take that last bit wow. of energy from hit points. Wow. Not, not the uh, coolest robot. No, they're not friendly. I prefer Robbie the Robot from Radio Shack back in the 80s. This game definitely uh, tempting you to put in your initials while your friend is like dying. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. If my brother watches this video, he's going to cringe at how uh, poorly I'm using Max, his favorite character. But like I said, I was never Max. This is the first time I've played through the game or a large part of the game as him. And uh, It's kind of like playing Altered Beast again, isn't it? No. <laughs> <laughs> never that bad. <laughs> Not to dump on uh, Altered Beast, right. but yeah. As far as gameplay and uh, enjoyability and... Uh, not being boring, uh, this game. I mean, this is one of the best games of the 16-bit era, yeah, hands definitely. down. And Altered Beast is definitely not a top-tier game. Although, like I, I've said in in our Altered Beast Let's Play, I loved the concept, um, and it just it didn't, um, you know, it didn't. Uh, uh, what's the expression I'm trying to think of? Come it to didn't fruition, put, put, uh, yeah, exactly. So to speak, you know, yeah. They didn't put use to the concept. Uh, immediate, another one of those robots. That's fine. That's what is the thing, yeah. You know, the these last end few levels are big time life eaters until you are really experienced oh. playing in general and playing as a team as well. These levels just really chew, go through your lives really quick. Well, I'm gonna hang on to this pipe for that reason. 
even though it feels cheap <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> well, it's so slow that there is a nice trade-off with it. The distance uh, uh, helps, you know, sometimes. Yeah, with the bigger that's guys, for sure. like that guy. Uh, you start to get surrounded, it becomes dangerous to even do the attack in the first place because the, the, the amount of time it takes you to get the attack out and then recover from it is often a, enough time for you to um, get hit from another wow. enemy. While <laughs> that... Wow. There, the final elevator, we're near <laughs> the end of the game. So it looks like we're going to make it without having to, uh, to use the cheat, which is impressive. But anyway, so now's the time to think of any last-minute points we wanted to make about this game or how uh, Metro Siege w uh, will differ. Um, please do visit uh, bitbeamcanon.com to see all of the projects that we're doing, including the two that we mentioned here mm -hmm. and our other um, videos. We've got a lot of uh, videos showing how we're making our games, oh, nice. uh, showing like Let's Plays or pixel artist analysis of famous and not-so-famous games. Um, so hopefully people will find entertainment and value in yeah, that we stuff. Yeah, we try to do lots of different types of content, uh, yeah. not always centered on our games. You know? Yeah, but all related to yeah. retro yeah. game development and pixel art in some form or fashion. Mm -hmm. um, that and baking bread for some reason, just kidding. <laughs> Yeah, my, my my skills for that aren't aren't up to par yet. You know, to start doing those. So. <laughs> All right, nice. I think there's one continue left. Oh no, there there might not be. This might be the end of it because um, there's three continues. I used one. I think you just use the second one. Oh right. Oh, you, you have six left. Oh no, yeah. So I might I might be the one to to bite the dust before the end of the game. So a continue in this game is. Just one character uses it, uh, as opposed yeah, to like five, five lines. right? Five, yeah, yeah. So yeah, I need to pay more attention if I. Uh oh, yeah. This might be the end for me. Uh... <sighs> oh, nice. There was one more continue, so nice. I think we're gonna make it to the end. If we, if I stop playing so sloppily, but it's hard having never played this max before. And there's so little walking room on the elevator, it's hard for us to keep away from each other, too. Oh, yeah, there we go. Take care of them quick that way. Clearly not inspired by anything Capcom made. No, I'm kidding. No, never. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Yeah, people will see when oh. they take a look at uh, Metro Siege that it w we uh, very intentionally are... Uh, we're basically taking... For, for a large part. Oop, did the game pause or just lagging really there? Uh, just, just lag, lag really. Yeah. Is my voice still holding up? Mm -hmm. Like it's not. Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, but anyway, we're like literally taking oh. <laughs> a lot of the best and most iconic uh, levels and characters and stuff and making the proper version. Yeah, we need What's to get away on? from each other. <laughs> Group suplexing or something. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> He literally changed direction at, like after the fact. He started dashing and just flipped around the other way. That was funny. Ah, uh, wow. Oops. Uh, I gotta get him. Whew. Uh, if I could. I'll do the cheap. Oh, that, that's another thing I can mention that's different. In Metro Siege, you actually have like a special move meter that you build up by beating people up instead of it taking your health, some of your health, to do a desperation move mm -hmm. or a, a strong attack. And uh, yeah, so so long as you have some of that desperation move meter or that special move meter built up, you can do it. Whereas yeah, in I never, this game, I never yeah. enjoyed the life. Uh, Gulping yeah, that always that annoyed me. Um, so, and then the other thing is, you can be a complete sitting duck in this game. Like when you need it most, the desperation move is when you're about to die and you don't have enough health meter left to do a desperation move. But that's what it's based on, so you're just screwed. You can't. Like if, in a, if a boss grabs you, your only hope is to use the desperation move, but you can't because it's. The desperation move is tied to your health, and they won't let you do it if your health bar is low. <laughs> Sorry. No problem. 
I think we have enough lives to get through this. Uh, the trick is to definitely stay on the extreme left or right edge of the screen and always in the top and try to work your way to Mr. Big, like outside of the range of his his uh, machine uh -huh. guns. Okay. Uh -huh. Once this guy's dead, which will be soon. Oh wow! There we go. Max's uh, strong attack desperation. So stay near the top. Uh -huh. And always, yeah, like that's a bad place for. There you go. And like when he positions himself in one of the top corners, you need to uh, uh, get outside of range, like behind him or something like that. Um, wow, his uh, smackdown with the uh, machine gun is really strong. Let me see if I can grab his punk ass here. Nope. He's got a whole other set of health bar to go through, too. Mm. Yeah, and I can't do my desperation because I don't have any health. Nah. Alright, all right. we might have to use the chi after all. Wow. Uh. Right, well, his last meter, we know because it's yellow. So, right. uh-oh. It's just me, and I'm down to my last life, too. <sighs> oh, I had to have that jerk on the, behind me. <laughs> oh, no, it's done. Oh, no, there's one more? Do I have one more? No. Oh, uh, it's acting like... No, it's over uh, both of us. We need to use... The... We are back after cheating. <laughs> Sorry, everyone. This game is really cool. First time we've ever played together, and we, you know, we're chatting the whole time, so... <laughs> You really can play with a lot of uh, style, and this game is really fun once you're in your groove. Um, but, uh, yeah, oh! Oh. And once you, like, sort of develop good patterns to handle these bosses. That yeah, I, d I definitely, when practicing, I didn't get to the very end, so I never yeah. practiced any on this guy. Yeah. He's, uh, and the he's later all bosses, over the place. He's, yeah. They are much cheaper. Like they've got moves that they're indestructible, um, oh, and stuff like sorry. that. Escape to the face. But the uh, the Axel Toro Toro, just oh. stay at a distance. Let them come in and hit them with the uh, uppercut. Works against almost everyone in the game. Though I'm not doing a good job demonstrating that at the moment. You want some of this? <laughs> there you go. I'll just keep plowing forward with my, uh, oh, and then use the desperation. There we go. Okay, here he is. So, remember up upper corners and just uh, try to um, stay out of reach of his uh, gun attack there. Nice. Oh. Yeah, so they're smart enough to give uh, the last bosses a um, special kind of desperation move of their own if you're really pummeling them. They can just oh. <laughs> become invulnerable for a second. Oops. It's gonna fall. Let's get to that one of the sides or the other. There we go. There we go. Grind this meter away. Oops. Is this a case for thugs? Uh keep coming until he's, he's gone. I think so. Okay. And yeah, that, that really makes it tough to uh, keep hitting the boss because you'll have some stupid thug come up on you from the other, you know, from your behind you, basically. That, well, that's nice. it. We beat. All right. So why can't we uh, beat the crap out of that uh, lazy boy recliner like it's a uh, to <laughs> Toyota? Just toss that <laughs> out the window. You know. it? Yeah. <laughs> Yep, so there it was. There's uh, the awesome Streets of Rage 2. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. yeah, it's an excellent, excellent game. Uh, yep. I think of, you know, uh, the gameplay is just super solid uh, in this game. In this yeah. Yep. And it really was a breath of fresh air that they, they did put more moves in than any game like it at the time. Mm -hmm. At least that I know of, and uh, that it really does allow you to make a lot more decisions on how you want to play uh, yeah, in I, any game. Yeah, I, I definitely think it outshined 
you know, the later final fights that they did on, on Super Nintendo, that, which were still really good games, but yeah, it, it just went a little beyond that uh, in terms yeah. of the controls and everything, you know. Yeah, and unfortunately, even according to most Streets of Rage fans like myself of the franchise, uh, two even outshine Streets of Rage 3. Like, it's one of those mm-hmm. cases of overdoing it. They yeah. had more memory to spend, so there were more characters and, and stuff like that, and uh, more moves still, but they made the game overly complicated in ways that weren't necessarily fun, and overly long, where, it, like, you don't want a game like this to start to really feel monotonous, and you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, but I still a very high quality game. And I do hear that the American version that I grew up with is actually much worse than the Japanese version. They decided to just make it drastically harder for no good reason than the American version when it was already a perfectly hard game. Yeah, they did uh, that with some... I, I never understood understood yeah. that uh, reasoning sometimes. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, that was, that was done to a lot of games. Uh, yeah, like maybe they just thought, oh, like, you know, if you're good at the game, you can play through the whole thing in a half hour. So if we make it hard, it'll make it feel like there's more value because you have to play it for months before you can ever beat the game, get good enough to beat it. So I have no idea if that play was it the, of, uh, Play it the whole weekend and, and not still not beat it kind of thing. Yeah, you know, exactly. Uh, That's quote-unquote value. You right. know, all that swearing, <laughs> yeah. all that swearing you did in frustration and jumping up and down on your controller that's yeah. uh that's value not that i ever did that but uh <laughs> anyway. so yeah um excellent game do you have any uh remaining uh like, you know thoughts last... about this particular game or, or uh... not really i mean um uh, yeah i think we covered the gist of it uh we could definitely have gotten into more of the technical specs. Oh, th- there was that one last point I actually started making and then got distracted with gameplay. Mm-hmm. Uh, that whole idea of if you're judging this game or learning from it or making really smooth animations where you have no memory concerns, keep in mind they had extreme memory concerns and even reuse was very limited because it was all based on a grid. I can't remember if it's 8x8 eight eight pixel or 16x16. 16 um, but it was very limited in that way where if you wanted to reuse graphics where you pretty much had to to fit all the moves in memory, now it was like, oh, well, yeah, but the head has to be exactly here. Right. And that's going to lead to your frames being unnaturally posed or unnaturally stiff. And they had to work within that and just get it to look as best they could to make it worth having the move and making the move understandable. Right. And you'll see they did a lot of cool tricks to save on memory. Because I could reuse the body parts in and control to the pixel where each body part is per frame, I had a lot more freedom for Metro Siege. So I could have many frames of animation for when an enemy gets hit and they reel back and then recover. Whereas on um, uh, games like this, you'll see even the arcade, arcade version of Final Fight, where in the arcades they had way more memory to use, You'll see it's like one pose, it's one single frame of them getting hit, Mm -hmm. and then they just programmatically shake the character back and forth quickly, one pixel, to add that emphasis, to add that like, ouch, I've been hit and I'm kind of jammed up. Right. So it's not actually an animation, it's one frame that's jiggling back and forth, and then the character pops back to a recovered mode, Yeah, but it we, works. We, well. we definitely have that advantage now of, of better tools. Like, I, this yeah. era of games was so short and fast that I would imagine that a lot of these 16-bit games coming off the 8-bit era, when it, when it all exploded and everything became incredibly popular for home consoles, that... You know, these people yep. probably had to dive in and, and use what they had uh, to make yep. it. So I would imagine, you, you know, there there were some developers taking that in, in new directions. Like you, you saw some games, uh, what was that game, the Vector Man or something yeah, like that? Yeah, that was a you know, where, where they were doing it. Yes, yeah. uh, but they, they still did it in a limited way. And I, I don't imagine yeah. they passed that technology around much or that software. 
Right, um, not in between studios. Yeah. Nintendo was nice that way. Like, they mm -hmm. did develop tool sets later on, like for the Super Nintendo, I think, and definitely things like the DS and the Switch, where there's like, here are, you know, our official development tools that will help you make optimized sprite animations and stuff like that. But um, that wasn't the case in general. Like, obviously, if Capcom makes a cool tool to make their games better, they're sure as heck not going to share that right. with Konami or another competitor. Um, yeah, and, it, and it's a, you know, we have the benefit. You know, it's a different world yep. today. People can much more easily share these things. There's better yeah. tools that are cheaper, some free that are amazing yeah. tools. And, uh, yeah, so yep. the... The amazing things that can be done with retro games now. Um, yeah, it, yeah, that's definitely true. Know. And then we have the hindsight. People have reverse engineered or like done interviews with the programmers, so now we know all of these tricks, which right. is one of the amazing things. Getting to work with Alex on Metro Siege, we've got the benefit of the analysis of all of the coolest things ever done on the Amiga, not just in games, but like the demo scene is incredibly strong even to this day on the Amiga, and they really figured out how to push the hardware yep. and do really cool stuff. So we get to sort of collect all the best gameplay design from all of these games and all of the coolest technical tricks to get the most wow factor. So it really is a massive advantage. I would say as a side note, those, a side note, those specifically for character animation, as I mentioned, they didn't have the luxury from a technical standpoint for Streets of Rage, because you have to have so many characters on screen, mm -hmm. and because they're sprites, the more individual sprites you have on screen overlapping or on the same horizontal row, the more you're going to get sprite flicker. Yep. So, like, if you keep them well organized in a grid, which is the usual methodology, then you're reducing sprite flicker as much as possible. Whereas if you're placing the head to the pixel wherever you want and then the torso there's going to be a lot more vertical overlap of more sprites right. and that is going to cause an insane amount not only does the uh that's going to cause the the need for more sprites being used by a lot which you just can't do for having this many characters on screen you only have 80 sprites to work with mm -hmm. and then on top of that even if you could you'd end up with way more sprite flicker all the time, which is just going to make your game look way less high quality and appealing. And uh, so because of those reasons, especially for games like this where you need lots of characters on, stre on screen, their only real viable method was the typical grid method, which is way more limiting. But on the Amiga with Metro Siege, I had that benefit, but the cost was we had to have the memory at all time of all characters facing both ways which is a disastrous uh yeah. use of memory like if we could flip on the fly like they can with sprites on the mega drive or the super nintendo or even the 8-bit nintendo uh then we could literally fit twice as many characters on screen in memory at a time like not on screen for performance but in memory we could have like twice as much variety of thugs and stuff like that right um, yeah but yeah so, or twice as many moves per character because, you know, you still have the same number of characters on screen, but they can do twice as many moves or t twice as smooth animation uh, or that kind of thing. Yeah, but, but anyway, you that, know, of course yeah. we always uh, enjoy working within the constraints. It's it's always a fun yeah. challenge, oh, yeah. I think, uh, for people, I guess, <laughs> you know, so. Sickos that love, uh, <laughs> love that, that um, yeah, super severe limitations and figuring out taking the time to figure out how to make it look like those limitations don't exist yep. and to like yeah it's uh, when i do that video uh showing sort of the behind the scenes and the technical constraints that we're dealing with for metro siege uh, i'll actually show how the animation frames for the characters are made and how many moves the character has and it's pretty shocking when you see how few body parts are used these tiny little body part images and only a handful of them are used to create this giant list of moves, this giant set of animations for the character. But it takes a lot of time and iteration and trying different things and constant like optimizing and redoing to right. make it look, look good and fit within the severe memory constraints. But anyway, that's, that'll be in a, in a future video. So if that kind of stuff interests you, then mm -hmm. uh, stay tuned for that.
All right, so that wraps it up for this. Uh, everyone, definitely check out our website, bitbeamcanon.com, to check out all the things we're doing and working on. There's quite a lot of things there. And we'll see you next time. If you enjoy our content and want to keep up to date on our games, please leave a like and subscribe. Also, if you want to support our projects, consider becoming a patron. The link's in the description, and we'll see you soon.